Welcome to SLP Nerdcast. I'm Kate. And I'm Amy, and we appreciate you tuning in. In our podcast, we will review and provide commentary on resources, literature, and discussed issues related to the field of speech language pathology. You can use this podcast for ASHA professional development. For more information about us and certification maintenance hours, go to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. SLP Nerdcast is brought to you in part by listeners like you. You can support our work by going to our website or social media pages and contributing. You can also find permanent products, notes, and other handouts, including a handout for this episode. Some items are free, others are not, but everything is always affordable. Visit our website, www.slpnerdcast.com to submit a call for papers to come on the show and present with us. Contact us anytime on Facebook, Instagram, or at info at slpnerdcast.com. We love hearing from our listeners and we can't wait to learn what you have to teach us. Just a quick disclaimer, the contents of this episode are not meant to replace clinical advice. SLP Nerdcast, its hosts and its guests do not represent or endorse specific products or procedures mentioned during our episodes unless otherwise stated. We are not PhDs, but we do research our material. We do our best to provide a thorough review and fair representation of each topic that we tackle. That being said, it is always likely that there is an article we've missed or another perspective that isn't shared. If you have something to add to the conversation, please email us. We would love to hear from you. Before we get started in today's episodes, financial and non-financial disclosures, um, I am the owner and founder of Grand Bois Therapy and Consulting, LLC, and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Amy Wonka is an employee of a public school system and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Uh, we're both members of ASHA SIG 12 and both serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. I am a member of the Berkshire Association for Behavior Analysis and Therapy, Mass ABA, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and the corresponding Speech Language Pathology and Applied Behavior Analysis Special Interest Group. So, AIM, what are we talking about today? We are talking about verbal behavior. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun. I feel like, I feel like um, it's, we're, I feel like we're cheating talking about verbal behavior. Does it feel naughty? No, we're not cheating. We're just, we're just expanding. We're, we're, we're broadening our horizons, man. Broadening That's true. That's true. So, so why did we choose this topic? Um, you know, I think most SLPs are going to interact with the BCBA at some point in their careers. We kind of covered this a bit in our collaboration podcast, but, you know, we're going to hear these terms. A lot of people who are working, I think, particularly pediatric therapists, you're, you're going to hear some of these terms thrown about helpful to know what, what they refer to. And the field of ABA is only growing. So even if you are in a SNF or in, you know, working with the elderly in some capacity, there is ABA happening everywhere. So I think it is, it could be, it could be relevant no matter where you work, depending. Um, and we, I think we've had a lot of discussions about this. We feel like the behavioral classifications of language, um, not only are they crucial to effective collaboration, but they can be helpful in your clinical work. Oh, I think so, for sure. Um, you know, verbal behavior is sometimes misunderstood. And I think through learning about it, you know, especially for certain clients, certain clients who are having challenges with acquiring language, you know, having that behavioral classification along with our more traditional form content use classification of language really can help just add an additional layer of information that lets us do our jobs a bit more effectively. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head a second ago when you said it was often misunderstood. Um, and before, as we were preparing for this podcast, I was I was telling Amy about um, my ex my first experiences with verbal behavior. So every clinician goes through a graduate program. Everybody gets, you know, ASHA sets these standards for what we learn about, what we don't learn about. But there are slight nuances. There are slight differences. And Amy had a lot of exposure or some exposure yeah. to the verbal classifications of language in her grad program. And I had zero. And when I went to my first job, I had a coworker who I adore, she's great, but she told me, we were working in a clinic that primarily worked with children with autism, and outpatient. I asked her, what's that? Outpatient. Yeah, it was an outpatient clinic, yeah. 
Um, and one of my clients was, you know, using all of these, using all these crazy words, man, tact, interverbal. And I was like, what's that? And I asked her cause she was more senior than me. She had more experience than me. And she told me that verbal behavior was when a BCBA took a child's device away and made them speak. And I was outraged, a appropriately so. It was, it was absurd. It was ridiculous. Um, and for years, that was what my definition of verbal behavior was. And I was 100% wrong. <laughs> um, there was, you know, so much more to it than that's not even close to what it is. And we would really like to set the record straight, I think, if there are other people out there who are operating with false um, ideas of what verbal behavior is. Well, and I think, I mean, to be fair, I think the field of verbal behavior, at least how the practitioner interacts with it, has changed a bit too. Um, I first learned about verbal behavior in the 90s. I went to see Vincent Carbone, who's a speaker who does a lot of trainings in like, I don't know, 97, 98 or something like that out on the Cape. And I went, I was like a paraprofessional at the time. I went with a speech pathologist and I remember us sitting there and he was very clearly like sign was the only alternative modality. So I do think you know, some of that has probably changed over time too, as both. We hope because that was like at least 20 years ago, right? Hmm? Was that we hope because that was at least 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so the field of AAC has changed so much since then. So, right. And I think, you know, I think that that's, that's a, an important point too, that even if you did have maybe not the best experiences working with people from the other field, like back in the day, we we will both provide better service by working together and educating one another. Um, so we meaning you and the speech pathologist and the BCBA or other provider who is using a verbal class verbal behavior classification of language. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we feel like this is a really important topic. Um, I think we both having learned about verbal behavior through an ABA program feel that it really does add value. Um, and we're excited to, we're excited to jump in, dive right in. So um, our three learning objectives or our three learning buckets for the day are, what is verbal behavior? Let's just define it. Um, where did it come from? What is the history behind verbal behavior and how, how did we get here? Number two, what are common uh, verbal operants that are also called the elementary verbal operants? And three, how is verbal behavior relevant to the practice of an SLP? Why should we care? Um, so that's, that's what we're going to cover. We have a little bit of a disclaimer um, before we jump into all of that. Well, actually two disclaimers, one smaller, one larger. The first is that a bulk of the information from today is coming from a textbook that um, BCBAs use. It's sort of like their Rhea Paul, um, their Rhea Paul book. It's like a... a, a large, thick, heavy book that en encompasses pretty much the entire field of ABA as an, in an, as an introductory uh, text. And so we're going to be going through a lot of that. There's going to be citations throughout the, the handout, but instead of repeating constantly, I refer to, you know, Cooper, Heron, and, and Heward. That's the name of the textbook. <clears throat> Just as a disclaimer, that's where a lot of this information is coming from. And the second disclaimer is that people spend their entire careers studying verbal behavior. This is an immensely dense, immensely dense, that probably yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the <laughs> immensely dense. That's a double doozy, a double doozy. Um, so it's a really, really dense topic, and we are not experts in this field. We are, I am a certified BCBA, but Amy did all of her base BCBA classwork and then just didn't take the exam. So we're educated in this topic, but we are not experts. And we are going to try and do a cursory overview um, of this incredibly detailed and complex work. And we will have additional references on our website in case anybody wants to do a deeper dive. And maybe but we'll like, do a deeper dive in the future. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this is kind of translating some of this as we understand it as yeah. sort of lay people who are not researchers of verbal behavior. Right. So. Okay. So learning bucket number one, what is verbal behavior and where did it come from? I mean, where did it all start, Kate? Tell us a little bit about this. Was there a person? <laughs> Once upon a time. In 1900. No, I'm just kidding. So, 
So, so way back in the day before 1900, um, or, you know, before in the early turn of the century, psychology was really dominated by ideas that were not measurable, things that were not observable. There was a lot of talk about introspection, feelings, um, very abstract concepts. You know, psychology was full of a lot of conjecture and hypotheticals. And um, a, a man named John Watson came along in 1913. It's like, I'm telling like the Oregon Trail here. He came like along it. in 1913 and he wrote an article called Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. And he basically founded the idea that psychology shouldn't be comprised of just internal thoughts and feelings, but it should be observable. And the focus should be on the relationship between a stimulus in, in the environment and a response. So most people are familiar with Watson's um, theories of psychology through Pavlov's, Pavlov's dogs. I feel like that's probably the most commonly known um, example. But the idea of this is called respondent conditioning or classical conditioning. And that's essentially where there is a response in the environment, an antecedent, res uh, I'm sorry, a stimulus in the environment, antecedent stimulus in the environment that has an effect on a response. Um, an example of this would be a bright light shining in your eyes and then the, your pupils dilating. So the stimulus in the environment is the bright, bright light and the re response is the dilation of your pupils. Um, as we've already covered in the field of ABA, we talked about this a little bit in our collaboration podcast, ABA sometimes has a bad reputation and it really started with this Watson guy. So in 1924, he wrote an article and claimed that he could take, this is a quote, a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and by my own special world, bring them up and I will guarantee to take any one of them at random, random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select, doctor, lawyer, artist. He basically makes the claim that through behavioral uh, through the behavioral lens of psychology, you could take any blank slate, any tiny baby, and raise them and control all of the environments, uh, all of the environment to make them into whatever you want. He basically throws genetics and and innate capabilities out the window. And and that's creepy. And a <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, to say the least, right? Like how messed up is that? It's the makings of kind of like a like a creepy sci-fi book. It's the Truman Show. Did you ever see yeah. that movie, The Truman yeah. Show? I really, I recently rewatched that. Have you seen that recently? No, I, I should rewatch it. What oh, was? it's so good. And when he like sails out into the, the, into the fake sea and he's so angry and they capsize his ship on purpose. Oh, so good. So basically this guy Watson, he gets a whole bunch of flack from pretty much everybody for making such an outlandish claim. Um, and that was in 1924. So then we jump ahead to 1938, about, I don't know, I don't do math, 10-ish years later, and he writes, a, and Skinner, B.F. Skinner, wrote a book called The Behavior of Organisms. I think everybody in our audience knows who Skinner is. Most of us have had some interaction with um, B.F. Skinner, having gone through the sciences um, in college and in graduate school. And the book, Behavior of Organisms, summarizes his laboratory work from 1930 to 1937. And he basically takes Watson's theory and expands on it a little bit. He says that respondent behavior or classical, classical conditioning of this relationship between the environmental stimulus and the response is a reflex, that it's a stimulus in the, it's the stimulus in the environment that elicits the response and that behavior is changed less by the stimulus that precedes it and more by a stimulus that follows it. So for the first time in history, he introduces the idea that behavior is shaped by a consequence, by something that happens after the response. And he's kind of, he's kind of sorting into two buckets, right? So there are the things that are more, that are just going to happen automatically, right? Right. The, the bright light is going to make your pupils dilate. That's it's just a reflex. That. Exactly. And then that's, different from all of these other behaviors, which are not like that. Those Correct. are related to what happens after them. Correct. Okay. So this relationship between an environmental stimulus, a response, and then another environmental stimulus 
is referred to as the three term contingency. And our listeners might think that we've jumped off a cliff and they're like, what the hell is this? I did not sign up for a history lesson in, for, in, in, in Skinner, you know, behaviorism. But understanding the three term contingency is a crucial component of understanding verbal behavior. So hang in there, <laughs> stay with us, stay with us. Um, so this three term conting contingency, the idea that behavior is more shaped by the environmental stimulus that comes after a behavior, after a response, becomes known as operant behavior. The word operant, you're going to hear a lot because we call them verbal operants in verbal behavior. So it's this idea that the, the three, the environmental stimulus after the response is what shapes the behavior. And sometimes we see that captured as like if the listeners can visualize like on your far left you see the letter a and then you see an arrow to the right and then you see the letter b and then you see an arrow to the right and then you see the letter c to kind of conceptualize that abc yeah like a the antecedent that first stimulus antecedent what comes before a mm -hmm. b behavior the thing in the middle the thing that we're focused on the response right and then that c on the far right that's the consequence. That's what comes after, right? right? Yes, ABC. So a lot of you out there who have worked with BCBAs, you'll hear ABC data. ABC is the acronym for this three-term contingency, antecedent behavior consequence. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Amy, for elaborate, for pausing us there. This is dense. This is dense. We're going to get through it. It's intense. Right. It's intense. So when we were preparing for this, we were trying to come up with some examples of this ABC, this three-term contingency that would be relatable. Um, and some of the ones we came up with, I think most of us have interacted with at least one, at least once. Um, the, one of the examples was a phone rings. So a phone rings in your environment. Well, nowadays you might just let it ring because it's probably a spammer and nobody has a home phone and home phone anymore. But let's say the phone rings and nobody has caller ID and it's back in the olden times. And that's the A part, right? That's the, the A. a part. So there's your answer, your antecedent, right? Okay. You, the B, the behavior is you pick up the phone. Okay. And the C is someone said, you pick up the phone and say, hello. And the C, the consequence, the stimulus after the response is that someone is talking to you. Someone wants to share something with you. Somebody has something to tell you. Somebody is communicating with you. So A, B, C, phone rings. You pick up the phone and say, hello. Someone is talking to you. If you learned over time, that when you picked up the phone, you got shocked or somebody screamed at you and told you that you were a stupid butt face, you <laughs> would probably learn pretty quickly that when the phone rang, you would not pick up the phone or you would pick it up and throw it or you would pick it up and smash it or something. The consequence that happened after you picked up the phone would shape what you did when the phone rang. Okay, let's do some more. Can we do some more? Let's do another one. Yes. Another A. What's another A? Another A. So um, a kid tantruming in the store. This okay. is a big one for all of us who have children because we love them, but sometimes, sometimes it can be a challenge. So let's say your kid has, uh, your, you've got your kid in the grocery cart and you're pushing your kid through the aisles and your kid sees the lollipops on the shelf. Yeah, because they put those right there. Right. Where right. So the stimulus in the environment, the antecedent A is the lollipops on the shelf. Then your kid starts screaming, I want a lollipop. Or if they're younger, they're just like having an absolute tantrum and being like, just, you know, everybody's judging you. You, you like, you're tired. You're like, God damn it. Sorry, it's curse word. Ugh, just be quiet. And you give the kid, you like take the bag off the shelf. You Can you tell I've been stuck inside with my children for, <laughs> for three weeks? You take the bag off the shelf, you rip it open and you give the kid a lollipop. The response was this, the tantrum and the consequence was the lollipop, right? That's the third, giving them the lollipop, eating the lollipop. The next so a, time, antecedent A, seeing the, the lollipop. B, B, your kid loses their noodles. <laughs> loses their noodles. And C, they get a lollipop, right? Okay. Next time you take that kid down the aisle at the grocery store and they see those lollipops, I doubt they're going to calmly say, excuse me, mommy, could I please, they're British, could, could I please have a s'more? Could I please have a lollipop? No, they're going to lose their minds. 
and they're going to have a massive tantrum in the grocery cart because the consequence, the, the C, has shaped the behavior of the baby. So back to our history lesson. I think that's a, those are likely common scenarios people have interacted with. This is a huge deal in the field at the time in history. Because Which is up at 38 ish. So it's yes, old 1938. So, so at this point in time, no one had really considered the interaction with the environment and the, the word contingency. So something happened con, happening contingent on something else. The contingencies between a behavior or a response and the environment. So Skinner took this idea and ran with it. He wrote a lot more over the next decade. Some books that people have may have may have heard of his Walden II, Science and, and Human Behavior. There is a lot more published overall on this idea of the three-term contingency and operant behavior. And in 1957, along comes dun, 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 Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior, um, which is really the whole point of this of this entire podcast. So. Verbal behavior, the, 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 the book, the piece of literature, it's, it was a massive, massive undertaking. And Skinner really felt like this was his biggest contribution to the universe. He started writing it in 1931, but it wasn't finished until 1957. Um, it is incredibly dense and it is very well known for being the most difficult of, his, of all of his works. And he did a lot. He's people's, and like we said, people, people spend their entire careers focusing on verbal behavior. But at the root of what verbal behavior was is that Skinner took the idea of the three-term contingency. He took the idea of consequences in the environment and added it to communication. He said that communication and communication acts, communicative behavior, was also subject to this three-term contingency. And yes. this was different than like the prevailing knowledge at the time massively which was set up by linguists like prior to that it was all a linguistic right so prior to this it was the it was the form of people were really interested in the form of language phonemes morphemes syntax there was a lot related to personality traits and how you know not necessarily related to acquisition of language but the use of language why people you know it was their will it was their free will it was their their wishes, their intentions, it was all wrapped up in hypotheticals, cognitive processes, all those kinds of things. We didn't have MRI machines. We didn't know a lot about the brain. Um, and for most of speech pathologists have probably learned about Noam Chomsky. That was only a handful of years later where he, pro he proposed his language, his mythical language acquisition device, the LAD, where he said that children are born with this um, innate ability to acquire language. And Skinner's like, no, 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 guys. And we take this for granted, but this was a monumental piece. Um, it's only, when you say the word apple, it's only an apple because someone handed you an apple. There was a consequence after you used that word that gave it meaning. And this was, um, this was a really, really big deal. So he focused on analyzing verbal behavior in, so Skinner's, let me go back. Skinner's main point was he was very focused on analyzing verbal behavior in the context of human behavior at large, just in general. And about 30 years later, a guy named Mark, Mark Sundberg, who is still around, um, he started looking at verbal behavior and this three-term contingency and how it mapped onto typical development. And he has focused a lot of his work into language assessment and language intervention using this as a lens. Um, in 1977, he wrote an analysis of sign language. In 1978, he wrote a program for teaching verbal behaviors to persons whom language is present or absent. So he really starts looking at disordered language and, and, the, and through the lens of verbal behavior. We have a long list of, we of references on our website. Um, Mark Sunderberg also has a lot of trainings online that I have taken that can be used, that you can get a certificate, you can use them for ASHA PD if you are interested in learning more about verbal behavior and development. Um, they're really, really in depth and really wonderful. I think he's through the Florida Institute of Technology. Don't quote me, I'm probably saying something really wrong, but somewhere in Florida, I think. Um, and I think he is most well known for the VB map. So he is an author of the VB map, which is an assessment tool we will talk a little bit about later. Um, I don't know, Amy, if there's anything you want to say about just the work of the VB map and how it fits into this historical timeline. 
Um, I think, you know, it's something, it's a tool. It's also like a curriculum planning tool. So it's something that I've seen used a lot in different environments by multiple service providers. I think it, you know, I love the guide that comes with it and we'll talk more about it later, but it does a really nice job just kind of translating some of these early elementary, mm -hmm. you know, verbal operants into a bit more understandable language. And it, because when he developed it, he did align it with develop, typical development and collaborate with other people, including a dual certified SLP BCBA. I think, you know, that, that makes it a bit more accessible and interdisciplinary. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice tool. Oh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, the other thing, I mean, verbal, the research of verbal behavior from a historical standpoint has continued and does continue. Um, we have a lot more information on our website about other resources you can read. You know, people have gone on to reclassify verbal behavior, things like topographical-based responding and selection-based responding, which is very, very complicated, and we are not going to get into that. But if you do want to read more about it, we'll have some re references listed on our website. So that is the history of verbal behavior. It was very important to go through it. So 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 what is it, Kate? What what is verbal behavior? Like so I think this is the beginning of the terminology split. So the definition of verbal behavior is behavior that is reinforced through the mediation of other persons. So if you think about that, it's he's Skinner is saying that verbal behavior is just behavior that is being reinforced or there is a contingency that is being mediated through another person in the environment. And the reason that I say this is the beginning of the terminology split between the two fields is that we call that communication <laughs> in general. So the definition of verbal behavior is communication at large. It's not speech. So in regular, in regular people words, what you're saying is that verbal behavior there, there has to be another person present that you're communicating with. Yes, there has to be another person. Well, not necessarily present. It could be email, but the, your, the behavior itself has to interact with a consequence that is mediated by another person. So again, back to that three-term contingency, it's all about the contact with the environment and the consequence that's being provided by the environment that is a consequence mediated by a person. So no communication partner at all, whether that's like in physical presence or virtual presence, not, not verbal behavior. Correct. Correct. And this, so I, I slightly misspoke earlier when I said that, that it's not speech. It can be speech, but it could also be lots of other things. So verbal behavior is sign. It can be writing, speaking, using a communication device. It's any behavior that's reinforced through the mediation of people in general. And this is an important, yeah. So is it also, is it also just behavior behavior? Like if I like knock my juice cup on the ground? If that behavior is mediated through a response from another person, then it could fit the definition. Okay. So, and what we would think of like as a, with my speech pathology hat firmly, firmly seated on my head. I would look at that as kind of pre-linguistic. Gesture. Right. Yes. So, but it is communication. So that's sort of where we have, you know, our two fields sort of branching off right from the start. So you say tomato, I say tomato, I say request, you say manned. You know, this is the, this is the beginning of the difference in terminology. And I think it's important to, now that we've gone through what it is and where it came from, I think it's really important to talk about what it is not. So verbal behavior is not forcing people to speak and not use their device, which is the definition that I was originally told. That's just bad clinical decision-making and maybe bad ABA where someone said that, that that's what they were doing and it was verbal behavior. Um, verbal behavior is not a program or protocol or a hierarchy that teaches speech. And I think over the years, there are, like you had said, that we, you know, we have our field, all of our fields have come a long way in the last 25 to 30 years. And I think over the years, clinicians have used some of these, you know, loose definitions from above and called them verbal behavior, but at its core, that's not what it is. And I think it's really, really, if anybody is listening who has had a bad run-in, 
You were just given the correct information about what verbal behavior is. Um, and I encourage you to share this podcast with anyone who, who you would like to, to, to correct on, you know, put them back in their lane. So it's not a set curriculum. No. Doing verbal behavior is not a set curriculum where you're doing step one first and then you do step two and then you do step three and then you do step four. To my knowledge, no. I, I could stand to be corrected and I, I welcome the feedback if anyone would like to send me that information. I think there are, there are curriculums out there that are rooted in verbal behavior. Like you mentioned the VB map that has a very, um, and the VB map is a great tool. This is not a knock on it, not at all. We're going to talk about how great it is later. But I think that there are some people who misconstrue what that curriculum is and then call it verbal behavior. But really what they're doing is the curriculum related to the VB map, which is rooted in verbal behavior as a framework. Which is similar to education as a whole, right? Education, we have theories of education, it doesn't mean this set third grade curriculum right. is all of science right. or right. whatnot. Right. Okay. Um, and I mean that, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of variability. We have a big country. There's a lot of variability geographically with what best standards are, what best practices are. Um, but verbal behavior in and of itself, if you look, if you go straight to the horse's mouth and look at Skinner's work and look at the work of all of the people who came after him. Verbal behavior is not any of these things that it has grown to have a reputation to be. So learning bucket number two, what are the verbal operants? And I think we agree that before we get into what the verbal operants are, we really need to go over what the three term contingency really is, right? I think so. I mean, I, I think that one thing that has been confusing for me when I was first learning more about verbal behavior were the different definitions that the field of applied behavior analysis uses for kind of common terminology that, that we just use colloquially, like reinforcement and punishment, positive right. and negative. Those things don't mean exactly the same thing that they do just colloquially in conversation in the field of applied behavior analysis. So I think right. sort of some of that out makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think people, people get these terms wrong so frequently that we really sort of take it for granted. And before we jump into that, we should say, we are going to put a visual support <laughs> yes. to AAC people. We're going to put a visual support up on our website to help explain this because it is very confusing. Even as we were preparing for this episode, we, we may or may not have had to do have had to practice this a couple of times to make sure that we explained it the right way um, without getting lost in the weeds. So there will be a visual support up on our website. We recommend that you take a look at it. Yes, we re but not if you're driving. If you're driving. Not if you're should. driving. If you're look driving, at it you later. What? You should not look at it now. You should, <laughs> you should not look at it now, no. Okay, so there are, I want you to visualize four different quadrants right? So there are two kinds of consequences. There are, there are reinforcers and there are punishers. Generally speaking, reinforcers will increase a behavior and punishers will decrease a behavior. And when we talk about increasing or decreasing those behaviors, we're talking about the future. So if something is being reinforced, it's more likely that it will happen in the future in a similar circumstance. If something's being punished, it's less likely that something will happen in the future in a similar circumstance. Right. So if you have two columns, there are reinforcers and then there are punishers. Now on the left-hand side, you've got another row heading, right? With, it, with positive and negative. So there are four quadrants. There is positive reinforcement, there is negative reinforcement, there is positive punishment, and there is negative punishment. Now we're going to go over positive reinforcement first. The definition of positive reinforcement is that when something is added after a behavior that increases the future frequency of that behavior. So back to the ABC, you've got your antecedent, what happens before the behavior, the behavior itself in the context of this talk, it's communication, a communication-related behavior. 
And then you have your C, your consequence. So a positive reinforcer is something that is added after the behavior that increases the future frequency of that behavior. Let's talk about an example of positive reinforcement. Okay. A mother, we already talked about this one a little bit earlier in the episode. The mother puts the child in a grocery store cart to do some shopping and the child tantrums. The mother gives the child a lollipop and the tantrum frequency increases. Now that means in the future, when the child goes in the grocery cart, it is more likely that the child will tantrum because it was given a positive reinforcer after that behavior. And positive in this case means plus the mom gave something to added. the child, the mom added something to the child, not positive. Oh, it was, a, it was a good thing. Right. So that's another common misconception is that the positive and negative of this is positive feelings, happy feelings, or negative unpleasant feelings. And what we're really talking about is positive reinforcement. Something is added. Negative reinforcement, that's a good segue into negative reinforcement, Mm -hmm. is when something is removed. So a negative reinforcer, negative reinforcement is that is when something is removed after a behavior that increases the future frequency of that behavior. So that is very different. It's negative reinforcement when something is added, but the behavior is still increasing. I mean, no, no. Amy's shaking her head at me like, no, 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 you said it wrong again. (laughs) Negative reinforcement is when something is removed. This is why we need the visuals for it. I know. And something is removed after a behavior that increases the future frequency of that behavior. So example. The mother puts the child in the grocery store cart to do some shopping and the child tantrums. As soon as the tantrum happens, the mother removes the child from the cart or the store and goes home. So what was removed in that? How did, how was that negative reinforcement? The, the yucky experience of being in the grocery store. Right. And that increases the future likelihood that when the child gets in the grocery store cart, they're going to tantrum so that the cart is removed or the grocery store is removed. So negative reinforcement. It's not necessarily unpleasant. Something is removed after a behavior that increases the future frequency of that behavior. So just to recap, positive reinforcement, something is added plus it makes it more likely for that behavior to happen in the future in a similar circumstance. Negative reinforcement doesn't necessarily mean bad feelings, just means subtraction. Something is subtracted that makes it more likely for that behavior to happen in the future in a similar circumstance. Right. So that's reinforcement when behavior is increasing. Let's talk about punishment. Punishment, we are, I mean, that's another huge word, right? We think of lots of things we do as punishment in our, in our culture and society, and it's always bad. It's always, it's always negative, but the, from a scientific perspective for this as a science punishment is when something is added or removed after a behavior that decreases the future frequency of that behavior. So in punishment, behavior is going down, behavior is being reduced and punishment has a thousand things that go along with it that we're not going to get into today. There's lots of negative, um, byproducts of using a lot of punishment. We are not going to get into that. We are not recommending any of these things. We are simply just explaining what all of them are. So positive punishment. So by, based on our definition of positive, it's when something is added, but the behavior is decreasing. So positive punishment is when something is added after a behavior that decreases the future frequency of that behavior. The exam example. A mother puts a child in the grocery store cart to do some shopping and the child tantrums. The mother yells at the child and the tantrum frequency decreases. I may or may not have been guilty of this myself as a parent. (laughs) So what is added in that scenario is the yelling. And the next time the child gets in the grocery store cart, they are likely not going to tantrum. If you, if you yelled properly, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you did your job. That was a horrible thing to say. I take it all back. It's retracted from the record, but scientifically speaking in a grocery store near you, right? scientifically speaking, pun, positive punishment is where something is added and the behavior decreases. So negative punishment. We know that negative is when something is removed. Negative punishment is when something is removed after a behavior that decreases the future frequency of that behavior. 
So example, the mother puts the child in the grocery store cart and the child has a lollipop in their hand. They're already in the tr- their cart. They're sipping on their lollipop. They're eating their lollipop. The child starts to tantrum. The mother takes away the lollipop and the tantrum frequency decreases. So what was removed in that scenario was the lollipop and the tantrum frequency decreases. That is, that's the lay of the land. I feel like thinking of it, conceptualizing it as that chart with pluses and minuses is so helpful for me because I think we have so many emotional connections to words like positive and negative and punishment. And so better understanding that in this case, it's more arithmetic than it is. Yes. These are, these are words that in the science of ABA have scientific definitions that are used in a laboratory not things that are used in your everyday life. I mean, we use a lot of these principles in our everyday life, but we have layman terms that are not congruent with how these terms are being used. So Kate, we're thinking about verbal behavior and as speech pathologists or others who are working with people who have communication needs, we are probably mostly thinking about behaviors we want to increase, right? So that would be reinforcer, things that are more likely to happen in the future under similar circumstances. And I know there are a couple of different types of reinforcers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So there are, I think in terms of, again, just like you said, using verbal behavior as a backdrop, the whole purpose of this, the word reinforcer does come up a lot in the definitions of the verbal operants. Um, There are reinforcers for specific items. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there are specific reinforcers. So Um, When we talk about mands, we'll talk about reinforcement that is very specific to the mand, but there are also generalized conditioned reinforcers that also comes up. What's that? What's that? That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. Generalized conditioned reinforcer. So a generalized conditioned reinforcer is a reinforcer that has been paired with many unconditioned and conditioned reinforcers. So without getting too technical about this, it's basically an item that you can exchange for many, many other items. And you don't have to be particularly motivated for anything in particular for that reinforcer to work. Money is the best example. So money is a generalized, is likely the most potent generalized conditioned reinforcer because you don't necessarily have to be motivated for anything in particular and you can exchange money for any number of basically an infinite number of things. Um, A lot of times in classrooms, we see other kinds of generalized reinforcers like token economies, um, stickers, I don't know, other kinds of items that could be exchanged in like a classroom store or traded in for more time at recess, all of those kinds of things. Um, Praise is another one. So praise is something that is another kind of conditioned reinforcer that we see a lot because it's not something that is specific to an item. It's been paired with a lot of different items over time. And I think that that's something that's interesting to think about uh, when you're working with people with autism or other developmental uh, disabilities where that may or may not be a a motivator for them or a reinforcer for them? That's such a good point. And this brings us back to the definition of a reinforcer. So if the behavior is not going up, it is not a reinforcer. So if you think, oh, but I told him good job. Well, little Johnny has autism and it makes him have all the uncomfortable feelings when you give him social interaction. Social interaction could be a punisher if the behavior is going down. So just because we think of something as a reinforcer, We think, oh, but it's a positive thing. It's a happy thing. It gives us all these happy feelings as a society. If the behavior is not going up, it is not a reinforcer by definition. I think that's such an important thing for clinicians to be aware of. Um, And not to get too far off course, but another piece that I remember learning and found really helpful clinically was just the idea that just because something is a reinforcer for one thing in one context, doesn't mean it's going to work all the time for everything, right? So you mentioned money. I'm a big fan of money. I have bills to pay. <laughs> I, need, I need the money to pay my bills. And, you know, I also enjoy praise. Like I, I feel good, you know, if, if people say kind things to me, 
um, I love my job, but if my only reinforcer was praise or tacos, if, if you right, got it, paid in tacos, I'd work for a day real hard, maybe two yeah, after a week, no thanks. I'm out so on I, tacos. <laughs> I mean, there's only so many tacos a person can eat. Even only so many tacos. <laughs> So that's why generalized conditioned reinforcers are so powerful because they can be exchanged for a limitless number of things. Well, yeah. Hypothetically yeah. limitless. Yes. Okay. So we have an understanding of what the three term contingency is. We have an understanding of different kinds of what reinforcers are, what reinforcement is, what punishment is, and what the different kinds of reinforcers are. Let's finally, after all of this time, talk about what the verbal operants are. So I think the most common one that speech pathologists come into contact with, at least in pediatrics, is the man. And this is the oh, one yeah. that I think- The what? man. The man. Yeah, the man. And every time I use this word, I feel like I'm cheating. I know I said that. I know I said that to you before, but I really do feel, I'll say it in a meeting and be like, oh, I hope nobody, I hope that a speech pathologist didn't hear me say that. I feel like, I feel like I did a bad thing. But a man has, the man has a very specific definition that I think is very important when- um, for collaboration, it's, it's, you know, it's really important for speech pathologists to understand what that is. We think of it as a request, but it's not entirely what it is. A mand is, here's the definition, verbal behavior in which the form of the response is under the control of a specific motivation and it has a history of a specific reinforcement. So it's, it's a lot a, of words. Again. It's another, it's, again, it's a lot of words. It's a communication act that is motivated by something very specific and it's reinforced by something that is very specific. So Amy, can you give us an example of what a man did? So one of the classic examples is you get stuff, right? So let's say we have a boy and our boy is thirsty and he says water and his mom gives him water right, right. away. So back to, the, back to the definition, he was motivated by his thirst. It was a specific motivation in place. The request, the mand, the actual communication act, the form of the request was specific and the reinforcement was specific. Mm -hmm. And in this context too, the specific reinforcement, I think, makes, makes a really important distinction. If you had given him a dollar, that's, that's not, that's not, you know, that's not doing what he wants. You would have shaped we... the word water to mean money. <laughs> Right, because right. it's all about the consequence, right? And right. this is the this is the difference in the verbal behavior lens is that it yes. is rooted in the consequences that happen after the communication act. Yes. So are man's always requests? No. So I think this is interesting. And this is a piece where speech language pathologists, we might, we would incorporate a lot of different pragmatic functions kind of under the umbrella of manned, right? So manned is certainly a request, but it's also a protest. It's kind of all of that regulatory communication. It's, it's getting things or making things go away, getting circumstances or making circumstances go away. So it's about, well, I think those are the most common. Um, I feel like any, if there is any communication act that has a specific reinforcement, I can't think of anything outside of requesting and making, getting things and making it go away. But and maybe if a listener has an example, <laughs> they can they can shoot it over to us. But I think you're right. That's the most important distinction is that it doesn't have to be, we think of it as a request, but it doesn't have to be. And I think another really interesting thing also is it doesn't have to be symbolic communication. So mans can be pre-symbolic communication. They can be gestural. And I think this is another piece where adding the verbal behavior conceptualization of language has been very helpful to me as somebody who works with a lot of more emergent communicators because it helps me classify some of these pre-symbolic behaviors and sort them into different categories so that I can better teach and, and shape progressively more symbolic communication. Right. So I was, I was having some imposter syndrome a couple of days ago while we were planning this and I reached out to a BCBA friend and I asked just passing the buck. If, you know, when someone is, you know, sitting and having a snack and they say, mm -hmm. and the, someone's, you know, hands them the glass of water, doesn't say, do you want a glass of water, but just hands them the glass of water. And they say, all done. 
and they shake their head and push it away. Is that a man? What they say. Yes. Yes, that is a man. Because it is under a specific motivation with a specific reinforcement. The and item in- is taken away. So we've kind of, back to our quadrant that we were talking about before, we've given an example of both positive and negative reinforcement. Right. But the, and exactly. And the behavior is increasing. So it's still reinforcement. It's more likely in the future that if they are not thirsty and given a glass of water and shove it and said, all done, the water would then, you know, they would say all done that that behavior would increase in the future. So that's a man. And I think that's a, a really common one. Let's talk about tact. So that tact is, is another thing that I think it, what'd you say? We, we have a colloquial definition for tact, right? Like she said it with tact, not the same oh. thing, not the same thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Not the same thing. No, no, no. So I think a lot of speech pathologists think of it as a comment, mm-hmm. but it's yep. not entirely what it is. Same sort of similar to the manding situation. So the definition of tact, the form of the communication act is under the control of a nonverbal stimulus. And the history of reinforcement is conditioned reinforcement. So sort of going along with the same water example, an example of this would be, you know, a boy and his family driving along a beautiful sea, you know, countryside, seaside, and they, he sees the ocean and he says water and the mother says, yes, that's the ocean. So in that example, the communication act of saying the word water was under the control of a non-verbal stimulus. So this is him interacting with the environment with his senses. You could, he sees the water. I guess you could also say if you were walking along and he heard a waterfall and said water and someone said, yes, that's a waterfall. He was using the word water under, because of an interaction, a a non-verbal interaction with with an environmental stimulus that was non-verbal is how I mean to say it. And I think that that is really cool because that gets us back to when we think about the verbal behavior classification of language as an addition to what you're already doing as a speech language pathologist. It helps you really break down not only the consequence is this, you know, a, a punishment, it'll happen less often in the future or a reinforcer, it'll happen more often, but also that like what, what was the antecedent, like what triggered the communication. And I think you know, thinking about things we see, smell, hear, touch, all of those, all of those components, you know, would trigger communication differently than feeling hungry inside our bodies. Definitely. So the only other, there's two more that I think are high, high frequency um, verbal behavior, verbal operands, the echoic and the introverbal. The echoic you, I, I think of often as speech imitation. Um, the, I feel like, what? I feel like that's the closest definition to what we would think of as SLPs. Yes. For me, this one, I'm like, okay, that, that kind of maps on to an existing thing in my brain. Yes. So let's try it. Okay. Let's do an echoic. Okay. Water. Water. <laughs> there you go. We did it. Yay. Yay. So there is an actual definition of a coic. Um, I have a book in front of me, which is the VB map manual. So page nine says, technically speaking, the echoic is controlled by a verbal SD. So that's what this is. Right. A, ver- a verbal yeah. stimulus. Think of it that mm-hmm. way. That matches, has point to point correspondence with the response. A coic behavior produces generalized conditioned reinforcement such as praise and attention so there you go i mean i think this is a less confusing i think where speech pathologists get into tricky water with this one is we call it stimulability um you know if you are trying to get a student or client to produce a certain sequence of sounds you may try to do it with imitation see if they can imitate you and I think often echoics are used for the same purpose by a BCVA, but they may not be looking, they don't have necessarily have that background in speech sound acquisition no, or no, oral motor don't. development. Um, so that can be 
I think, a discussion to be had with the BCBA about why they're using a COEX, um, you know, as we call them, speech stimulability. And, and a learning opportunity and an opportunity to collaborate more effectively and share what we know and with others. Shameless plug, go listen to our collaboration episode for more information on that. And the last one is, is intraverbal. Intraverbal to me have always been a little confusing. Uh, in my notes here, I have written, it's a doozy. So it may not be a doozy for everyone, but for me, it's a doozy. So an intraverbal is where the form of the communication, the response is under the control of a verbal stimulus that does not have point-to-point -point correspondence with the verbal stimulus and has a history of generalized conditioned reinforcement, which is extremely confusing. So it's essentially that, what? It was so many words. So many, so, many. so many words. So I think the best way to think of this is that the response, the antecedent is a verbal response. So back to your ABC, the behavior, the word, the selection of an icon on a screen, the sign that was made, the gesture that was made, the antecedent to that is a verbal stimulus. And what happens after it is some sort of condition, generalized conditioned reinforcement. You, that's its history most of the time. So let's try one. Amy, do you want something to drink? I'd like some water. There you go. So Amy used the same word water, but instead of seeing water or hearing water or being motivated for water, she was given a verbal stimulus, a question, to which she used the word water as a response. And I think to, to go back to the VBMAP manual, really quickly, they do a really nice job kind of explaining what Kate has just told us, right? So the difference between a manned, a manned is something that, you know, that antecedent really is that personal motivation. So the A of the ABC is the personal motivation. The tact, that antecedent is really the elements of the physical environment. And then for a coex and intraverbals, that antecedent is someone is some verbal stimuli. So thinking about those different antecedents really helps you sort out, you know, what these how applied behavior analysis framework is going to sort these different types of communication functions. It really is kind of connected to that antecedent part. And I think the, we had said this, I'm, apologies if we already said this during this episode, we've said this to each other multiple times at this point, but to me, it's sort of an iceberg. So the top, you know, you're on the water, you can only see the top, that top that you can only see is verbal behavior, but there's a whole mountain underneath. So everything that this speech pathologist brings to the table, knowledge of development, oral motor structures, phonology, you know, semantics, syntax, all of those things are a wonderful foundation. And I always felt that verbal behavior was what I was missing. And it's the tippy tippy top. And if you see the whole mountain, I think they complement each other so well. I agree with you. I think that looking and adding this into your toolbox as a speech language pathologist can be very helpful, especially if you are working with somebody who doesn't just automatically generalize in, in ABA, they talk a lot about generalizing or your ability to learn a skill and then apply that skill with new people, new environments, new tasks. Some of, some of the folks who, who I work with are able to do that readily. You learn a new word, you're able to use it in different ways with new people at different times in different environments. I think that when you're supporting folks who that might be a bigger challenge for, being able to kind of look at these different verbal operants and think about the different ways in which the people are using the vocabulary that you've been taught um, can be really helpful in terms of planning and just optimizing your client's success. Definitely. So I feel like that's a good segue into bucket number three, our third and final learning bucket. How is verbal behavior even relevant to the work of the SLP? I feel like we've touched on little pieces of this um, throughout the episode, but for me, one of the biggest pieces of value has been what you just said. It's been the different lens that I can look through when I'm looking at my clients and why they, why are they not the, how are they doing what they're doing or what happened in their developmental trajectory, but why? So what is the reinforcement? What, what are the environmental variables that are, um, 
contributing, particularly for our learners with autism who may have very specific channels of reinforcement. You know, they may not, you know, they might be motivated by strings instead of praise, or they might be motivated by something else very idiosyncratic to them. Um, I feel like that has been one of the largest contributors for me. Um, that and collaborating. It's so hard to collaborate with another professional if you're using a whole different set of jargon. Right. And I mean, I, I think back to our entire podcast about collaborating with ABA professionals, I mean, I think there can be there can be challenges there because we're approaching things from a different lens. Both of us feel passionately about trying to support our clients best. And if we can't have a shared a shared discussion around, you know, how we're approaching a particular challenge, it, it makes it, it can make it really hard. And on the flip side, it can really help you optimize your services. If you're able to have a productive discussion where you're using this very comprehensive um, method of looking at what a client is and isn't able to do in a present moment. Definitely. Um, I really wanted to take just a couple minutes and talk about the BB nap as an assessment sure. tool, because I, I feel like it's a great complement to our traditional battery of speech and language tests. Um, and you are much more familiar with it than I am. So one of the things that's great about the VBMAP as an assessment tool is that it's criterion referenced. So criterion referenced assessments are going to allow us to get a much better description of what a client actually can do. I feel like particularly for emergent communicators, we may be able to administer a standardized test. We may be able to get some information about that. Most of that information is about what this person can't do. I don't, I, I, that's not as helpful information for me as a clinician. I want to know what you can do, where your strength areas are. Um, that's very well said. We don't need any more information about what you can't do. We need information right. about what you can do. And I mean, depending on your work environment, you might, right? You probably, if you're outpatient, you need to, you know, submit something to a funding source on a regular interval to qualify for continued service. But outside of that, as a clinician, that information is the least important information to me. Um, so what's nice about the VB map is that it's criterion referenced. It's also banded along developmental strands. So when you look at the tool as a whole, it has three different levels, level one, level two, and level three. Skills that are within level one are skills that correspond with, I believe, zero to 12 months old. Um, and then it moves progressively up from there until it reaches, yeah, it, first level is zero to 18 months. Sorry, I misspoke. And then level two is 18 to 30 months. And level three includes skills that correspond with a developmental, a typically developmental um, range of 30 to 48 months. So it looks at all the verbal operants that we talked about today, the MAND, the TACT, the ECHOIC, and the intraverbal. The ECHOIC section was written by somebody who's a duly certified SLP BCBA, which is another thing I really like about this tool. Um, it has been it has been revised at least once. I have an old copy. So some of that, there are some changes uh, that have come out more recently, but the changes are based upon feedback from multiple disciplines, which I think is nice. I also really like that in the introduction, what you get is you get sort of a guidebook that walks you through all of the components, and then you get an assessment protocol that you would fill in for your client. And when you read the manual, it does a really nice job of describing these different verbal operants. It also does a really nice job encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration. And that, that's my question. So I have been told before that a speech pathologist is not allowed to administer the BB map. Could you please set the record straight? I would like to set the record straight. They do say, I wasn't completely com prepared because I would have just like turned to the page of the manual and quoted it. They do say that whoever administers the test does need to have basic familiarity with the with verbal behavior. So you're not going to be able to 
administer a verbal behavior based assessment if you've, if never, you've never heard of, if you think that verbal behavior is something that it completely isn't or something. Right, right. However, they do make the point, and I'm not finding it here, but it's somewhere in the introduction of the manual. They make the point that some sections may be best filled out by a speech language pathologist. And that includes the ECOIC section and I think the linguistic structure section. So it's a so, great test to use in a collaborative way. It's awesome to use in a collaborative way because back to collaboration and how it can be helpful, it's really nice for the speech pathologist to be able to work collectively with maybe a special educator or the BCBA or the EI provider, fill this out collaboratively and then do whatever additional assessments you feel like you might do an independent and relational phonological analysis. You might do a Goldman Fristo, you know, you might, you might do parts of the PLS or something like that to supplement this information. Um, but it's a great opportunity to work collaboratively with colleagues and allows you to share your knowledge about speech and language in a way that is task focused. I think it can be a very helpful tool. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. I'm a little intimidated by the BB map, even though technically I'm a BCBA. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> no. okay. It's a helpful tool. Um, I, I feel like just based on time, we have to wrap up, but um, I don't have, do you have anything else to add? This was a very, very dense topic and I applaud anyone who is still listening. <laughs> if you're not driving, take, take a second to check out that table about punishment and reinforcement if that, if that is still a little confusing. And I think just to be aware that it's another way to look at language that can add to your practice and, and could be helpful. Totally agree. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Don't forget, you can use this podcast to get ASHA PD. Uh, go to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. Click on the episode and follow the prompts to get your certificate. Uh, find us on Instagram. If you're so inclined, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or any other medium where you, where you come and visit, hang out with us. Um, we have some fun episodes coming up. We have implementation plans and an episode or two on feeding and swallowing in school. So stay tuned and thanks for joining us. <laughs>